Hello and welcome to Community Topics, number 25 of Dual Security. I am never what you think I am, no matter how sure you feel like you are about who I am or who anyone is, for that matter. It's never, ever the reality of what they are. But in understanding that, you may actually see them a little bit more clearly. Regardless of how much I want to believe that I am what I think I am. I think that's the point. It's habitual. There's a certain comfort in it. It's not necessarily that it's a bad thing, but it certainly is limiting. It certainly does cause conflict because if you're one thing, then you're not everything else. And I think the thing I've recognized over time is that what I am is largely due to the moment that I am a part of. So there have been numerous different points in my life where I've had to be a different piece to that moment. I've had to be a different part to what was happening that often fell outside my idea of myself. And of course, that was very jarring to me. I would actually say like, oh, I didn't feel like myself there. And I'd get right back into the groove of thinking I knew who I was. But you don't necessarily have to live there. But there is some benefit to looking at each role that you play throughout your life. There is some benefit in recognizing how many facets you actually do have, or at least how many facets you've revealed to yourself so far, because they're infinite. That all said, this week's community topic, singular, is personality tests. And the reason that we're doing that in the singular, the reason we're not taking on a sec secondary topic is because frankly, this one's a big one. I'm very excited about this one. There's a lot in this one because it really does go back down to that core motivation or that core habitual intention of ours to classify ourselves. There is some benefit to doing this because we get to actually self-reflect and look at ourselves, but there's also a huge danger and a huge temptation that goes with this. And so it ties into so many other things that we talk about here on Dualistic Unity. It's going to be a great episode. I'm very excited. So Andrew, your thoughts first, and then we'll actually get into the different results of our tests. Yeah, I'm I'm glad that we took the test and and we'll be able to compare because even just in, in the time I did have to kind of compare Ray and my results of, of what we got, it is it's very interesting to see and, and to be able to kind of point out some things that are like, oh yeah, that one that one makes sense. But there is that desire, as Ray said, to cling to it and to almost mold it into something that fits into the way you think of yourself. And so it's very important to keep that in mind, keep the idea of what our brain does, tries to find certainty in things. It's a habitual tool that is super useful in a lot of ways, but to be careful of it. And when we do start to get caught up in trying to define ourselves just to to understand that you're undefinable as as similar to the idea of yourself as you have to the personality trait response or, or results that you get from taking one of these it can't possibly define you and and it can almost allow you to get more lost in the idea of yourself if it feels pretty spot on and so understanding that that is the mechanism of our brain helps to keep in mind going through something like this. But, you know, that all said, doesn't mean it's not fun to do and fun to uh, look at, especially in comparison to someone that you work with every day and communicate <laughs> with a lot. Um, so, yeah, I'm excited to uh, dig into some of these results. Likewise, for sure. It's funny. I actually haven't spent a great deal of time comparing our profiles, because I figured it would be much more fun at the moment to explore them first. Uh, for everybody listening, of course, we did the Myers-Briggs test, or rather a shortened form of it through a website, uh, which I will list here, truity.com. You can check it out yourself. Um, the Myers-Briggs test, of course, looks at basically psychological preferences and behavioral patterns as a result of those psychological preferences. And so, for example, uh, whether you're introverted or extroverted, whether you're more sensing or intuitive, whether you think more or feel more, whether you perceive more or judge more. And so we're somewhere within a spectrum of those four categories. And so as a result of doing the test, you are given a designation 
in, in the form of a four letter category, kind of telling you who you are and how you behave based on your preferences and based on the answers that you've given in this test. And so it's surprisingly very accurate. It's actually really quite good. It's a brilliant test, but there is an underlying note that this is you. And I think that that really is the only significant danger because I want to say and preface this entire episode by mentioning that I've done this test before a few times at different points in my life. And at each different point in my life, at each different intention in my life, I've had a dramatically different result. Not just a little bit different, dramatically different. So the answers that I got this time around were very clearly the result of the person that I am right now and the role that I play right now in terms of my environment, my day-to-day -day conversations, my intention and everything else. It very much is not who I am, but who I choose to be for a moment to moment, the direction I choose to go in. And that changes my preferences and that changes my behaviors. And so there's a certain degree of responsibility in that that leads to freedom. You can change. You are changing. So don't get attached to it, but definitely check it out because the test is super interesting. So that all said, Andrew, what'd you get? Uh, so I got, uh, just lay it out there, ENFJ. Um, and I guess going into percentages, I think, because it does give percentages um, for each side. I think that's important because some of mine were more extreme than others. And I, I did like what you said about you know, the role that you're currently playing, because I see that having impact and, and how you see yourself isn't necessarily going to be how everyone else sees you or, or how you perceive yourself isn't going to be the same as you actually are. Like we're all, all veiled by our own preferences and, and perceptions. So it's never going to be a hundred percent accurate. And so it is important to take it with a grain of salt, but it still can tell you something, I guess, a little bit. And so for me, um, just to go through the percentages, um, extroverted, I got 80% relative to introverted. Uh, intuitive, 72% relative to sensing. Uh, feeling was 54% relative to 46% thinking and uh, judging was 62% whereas perceiving was 38%. And so some are obviously more extreme, those first two extroverted and intuitive, which is funny because growing up, I always said that I was an introvert. Like I always just thought that. And because I was super quiet growing up, I just kind of equated those two things. But really that was just because I was very concerned with the judgment of others and everyone has a degree of both i would say but i think now in more of a willingness to put myself out there less of a concern with others like i i do embody more extroverted uh, characteristics and i think part of me always saw being introverted as something i didn't like about myself and so that probably just being honest plays a role in the way that I take this test. Like I want to see myself as more extroverted because I had that idea of myself back then that realistically I didn't like myself as much when I characterize myself as that. And so again, it all plays a part in the results that you get. Um, but I found that very interesting. And so I'll, Pass it to Ray because we were, you know, similar on some, but not on others. And I'm very curious about your percentages as well. Yeah, I think that was the most surprising thing for me was the percentages, honestly, because we're not very different in terms of the uh, intuitive versus sensing. I was 74% intuitive. And so that, that was a pretty strong lean on that side. But what's really interesting is that most people, and I know most people would consider me to be quite extroverted. Like I'm very much a people person, whereas I would consider myself to be more on the introvert side because I really enjoy my peace and my quiet and my time for self-reflection. I enjoy my own company. I enjoy the moment. And so 
I thought it was really interesting that I was right on the border. I'm quite literally 51% extroverted and 49% introverted, which I thought was just hilarious, which means that I was bordering between ENTP and INTP, which is kind of funny. So I ended up being ENTP, uh, feeling versus thinking. I was 54% on the thinking side and 46% on the feeling side. And that makes a lot of sense, actually, because over time I've learned to value both but I do lean more on the thinking side because I'm aware that feelings can really take you for a ride. So you really have to kind of govern that. Um, and then on the other side, I was 57% perceiving and 43% judging, which I find funny because again, there's discernment, but just the willingness to watch without judgment as well. So it was interesting. I thought it was quite the, uh, quite the run through, but what I find really interesting is that both of our types are actually fairly rare, not just in people, but in, in the male population as well. Um, I wanted to explore very quickly that um, ENFJs, which is, of course, Andrew, are likely to have the gift of expression, but they may use it in speaking to audiences rather than in writing. And that was actually by Isabel Briggs Myers. So that's really interesting. But some other interesting facts uh, about ENFJs is on personality trait scale, they score as active, pleasant, sociable, demanding, impatient, appreciative, and compromising, which uh, Andrew might recognize some of those traits within himself, especially as he's growing and, and adapting to the reality around him and the people that he talks to, uh, most likely of all types to cope with stress by exercising, most likely of all types to believe in a higher spiritual power, uh, ranked by psychologists as among least likely to have trouble in school. Personal values include friendship, education and learning, creativity, and community service. Uh, they are among types highest in job satisfaction, but also among most likely to report plans to leave their jobs. Commonly found in careers in religion, teaching, and the arts. And of course, the, uh, the name for Andrew's type is the teacher, which I found to be very interesting considering the role that he is currently playing. Yeah, that uh, all of that is funny and, and fascinating to me, especially taking it from the perspective of not being an individual, you know, like because I have this up in front of me as well. Um, likely to cope with stress by exercising. I've worked out like literally haven't missed probably two or three weeks since I was like 13. I started lifting weights and I played sports my whole life. And so it's just been been a massive part. It's al almost like was a part of my life before stress became a part of my life. So it was just something that continued on. So it was almost like I was doing it before the stress even happened, which is just very telling of of the, uh, I don't know, explanation or, or this fact about an ENFJ. Um, believing in a higher spiritual power is obviously very funny in having this conversation because it's not so much a belief, but a recognition that I am it. <laughs> not to put it lightly, but um, yeah. And trouble in school, I've never really had that. I did pretty well in school throughout my life, despite now understanding the, uh, the pitfalls of and the limitations of the schooling system. It was a place that I was able to kind of succeed in, um, despite not really having ever like a good reason to it was always just did it because that's what I was told to do and worked hard because I wanted to you know, make something of myself. And <laughs> since I have, uh, you know, more or less let go of that, that's driving, but, uh, yeah, job, uh, job satisfaction. And then most likely to report plans to leave. I found that funny because, um, reporting plans to leave, obviously we were talking Ray and I decided for a while to uh, leave our jobs, but even in that situation, like I gave my company a massive heads up in leaving my job. I think I gave like a month and a half because I knew when the day was going to be December 1st. So I was like, fuck it. I might as well, you know, give them a heads up. I know it would be helpful for them if they had more of a heads up to find someone, blah, blah, blah. And I guess that goes into, you know, the other explanations of this uh, type of thing. And then careers in religion, teaching and the arts is like, kind of where all of this falls but it's it's the most anti-religious religion you could ever possibly have and and we very much push against that idea of being a religion but in a certain context 
people could compare it to that just with a different approach. And so seeing all of those examples, it's, it's just funny because I can see myself, I can point to situations where, yeah, that, that, you know, makes a lot of sense. Again, important not to get so wrapped up in it and, and dig so deeply, kind of like in the, the number 23, you can get so lost in it that you're almost just trying to prove things about it and, and find that confirmation bias in everything. Like, and, and there's a sort of satisfaction in that because you have are able to fall into the sense of certainty about who or what you are. Like, oh, I'm an ENFJ. There's people who fucking put in their Instagram bios, their Myers-Briggs results. And uh, you can get so lost in it, but it is, uh, you know, it's fun. It's fun to look at. And so it, it's also fun for Ray and I to compare <laughs> these two because you know, we come at things from much as we come to the same recognition, a lot of times we do it in different ways. Um, and I think with those last two, the FJ for me and the TP for Ray, um, that's, I think, part of part of this processing as well. Like I very much see that I could see myself being TP in you know five or 10 years. And I think that's a lot of just where I'm currently at with working through things uh, in in my own life. I would agree. I would absolutely agree. Because you'll notice that in my test, for example, the reason that I ended up with TP, it's just barely, it's 54% thinking, it's 57% perceiving, right? And that's largely because of the work I've done over time, patience that I've developed and whatnot. Um, so I find it really interesting how, again, my test results have changed to a very large degree. Um, in some ways, I, I was on the other end of the spectrum in those last two results, but certainly in the first one, I remember very much being an I, an introvert in the last test that I ran, actually the last several tests that I did in terms of Myers-Briggs. And so it's really interesting that I had the results ENTP this time, and I'll just give our listener a brief run through about ENTP, which is also one of the rarer types in the population. Um, ENTPs tend to be independent, analytical, and impersonal in their relations with people, and they are more apt to consider how others may affect their projects than how their projects may affect others. And I find that really funny because that's certainly something that I work very hard against. Getting so caught up in a project or an idea or a vision that it doesn't consider everybody that it impacts. And so we're going to explore this a little more in depth when we start comparing the differences between where Andrew is categorized and where I'm categorized, because I recognize a lot of the pitfalls of the mentality that I'm in, and I actively have to work against them. And so I think that in looking at the contrast between our two mentalities, we're going to see a lot of the things that I talked about deliberately working against in the show. So I'm very curious to start talking about that in a second, but I'll keep going. Interesting facts about the ENTP. On personality trait scales, they are scored as enterprising, friendly, resourceful, headstrong, self-centered, and independent. They are least likely of all types to suffer heart disease and hypertension. They are least likely of all types to report stress associated with family and health. They are scored among highest of all types in available resources for coping with stress. They are overrepresented among those with type A behavior, among highest of all types on measures of creativity, one of the two types most frequent among violators of college alcohol policies, among types most dissatisfied with their work, despite being among the types with the highest income, commonly found in careers in science, management, technology, and the arts. And of course, ENTP is summarized as the visionary, which I found really interesting. But the part about that that's very true is the temptation to be self-centered. Because in being intelligent, in being able to succeed in certain environments or under certain challenges, you start to have that temptation and think of yourself as more valuable. And that is very much one of the things that I work against constantly, is the idea that any of it means anything about me whatsoever, including... ENTP. Yeah, I found all of that uh, very interesting. It's it's funny to hear the uh, descriptions and how we can see, you know, examples of it in our interactions almost, and and coming at it from that point of view. You know, in my in myself, a lot of the uh, 
ENFJ talks about, you know, being empathetic and having concern for others. And it's funny how that's evolved for myself. Like I can very much, I, I can't so much speak for Ray's experience before I met him, but in myself, it's almost like we had like natural tendencies that we've both worked through and still come up in certain situations, but we've both been able to utilize them in different ways. Like for me, concern for others used to be very much pinned on myself, like my concern for how other people perceive Andrew. And so as I have let go of that more and more, and even starting, you know, five, six years ago, when I stopped being so concerned with other people and realized that, oh, maybe they're not thinking about me as much as I think that they're thinking about me. It's been able to mold or, or morph into doing all my social media stuff. And, and it's still being very involved in concern for others, but in more of an empathetic way, as opposed to an egotistical, like self-centered way, like my egotism for a long time was rooted in fear of judgment and, and concern wrapped up in the idea of myself. And, and since letting go of that, it's still there concern for others, but it's on more of a, you know, quote unquote, external point of view. And so it's, it's interesting too, with some of the descriptions of, of Ray's side of things, how that there's still things that are there, but, as you become aware of them, you're able to almost use them in a beneficial way. Like it's like always, we always had a tool and over time you learn how to use it. At first it was like using you. And then as you, it, you use it, it changes everything about it. And yeah, I will keep getting into this, but there's a lot of things between these two personality types that kind of complement each other that if we were both more like each other in certain ways, like it probably wouldn't work nearly as well, which is very funny. I agree. That's why dualistic unity tends to work so well. You tend to focus very much on the empathetic side and I tend to lean a little bit more towards the um, problem solving side. And because of that, we have a balance. So it's not just about coming up with a great strategy, but how is it applicable? And I'd like to say for myself that that's been a huge part of my own journey as a whole has been playing my own devil's advocate, actually, you know, creating an Andrew, as it were, in my head long before Andrew ever came along to play devil's advocate to remind me like people, right, people, remember people. And so over time, I've, I've worked my way more towards that. And I find it super interesting as well, because so at one point, I was very much an introvert. I, I think I was like an ISFJ or something like that. And the point is, is that I was so involved with myself. I was super involved with how I felt, super involved with how my, my relationship with the world, how things should be, things like that. It was way more on the sensitive side than on the side uh of fortitude, I guess you would say more, more affects you on that side, because frankly, you're more sensitive and you're more sensitive because you're cut off from reality. You're kind of self-involved and thinking about yourself to a large degree. And that's pro the problem with being too much of an introvert. So I love the fact that I was 51% introvert and or 51% extrovert and 49% introvert this time around, because that could easily switch based on the day and how I feel in that day. I find that amazing because that really is the difference. How seriously do you take yourself? And that changes the rest of what you experience. Right. But yeah, I will say that the polarity between your behavior and mine works as a good catalyst for conversation because we have the same intention to grow, but we're tackling it from two different perspectives. Some of that is based on time. Some of that is based on how we grew up. Some of that is based on our own preferences and behaviors. Right. But it is. It's a good partnership for sure. And now we should probably take a look at how they mix. So I thought this was really interesting. So this is off a different website, uh, personality at work.co, just to give them a brief shout out. Um, so 
they compare our personalities and they say the ENFJ is the harmonious people people's champion, warm, caring, and extremely organized. The ENFJ, or we'll just say Andrew, will be the one person to turn to for help. They are authentic, insightful, and great at turn and tuning in to how others are feeling and making people feel truly special. They are found at the emotional heart of a group, selfless, acting as the glue, an unusual combination of bossy and caring. And I can very much resonate with that state of mind. And there are so many things there that over time I've either willingly pulled away from or had to choose to step away from for the point of something else. So I love that that summary. And I think it's actually fairly accurate, though I would never honestly call Andrew anywhere near anything close to bossy. As for ENTP, curious, communicative, with a need to challenge, ENTPs love the intellectual debate, are spontaneous and assertive. They have a unique view of the world and bring a fresh perspective. This can make them intellectually promiscuous. Oh, enjoying one new experience after another and failing to follow through on their great ideas as they look for bigger and more novel experiences. Now, that is, again, one of those things that I'm very aware of, that because you have so many great ideas, you can just go from one to the other to the other. Right. But in doing so, you lack depth. And that's that understanding of the moment as well. The benefit of just sitting still is recognizing how much is there in that, in just the experience of settling into the thing you're doing now. So that's another thing that's very much helped me govern the mentality I'm in. But I find that very interesting that it's in there. Yeah, it's definitely interesting. And I can tell with certain things that you have an understanding of the uh i don't know it's almost like nat you know quote unquote natural tendencies but not really um but you're aware of them and so therefore you can use them in a way that's even more beneficial it's like you can take it for what it is and like i don't know like harness the energy that comes from that and like kind of shift the direction of it because you do come up with a lot of awesome ideas like a lot of the stuff that we do now that all the ways that dualist community has expanded has come from just thoughts that Ray's had about certain things. And I'm like, kind of just along for the ride. Like, Oh, you want to do that? Yeah, let's fucking do it. Let's fucking go, uh, roll with it. And, uh, but at the same time, like there is a following through that I can tell is it's not that it doesn't come more naturally, but you can tell it's like the natural tendency is, all of the ideas and it's like, you're aware of it. So you can temper it and bring it back to like reality. And you almost check yourself sometimes, which is, which is always funny. Whereas that's not really where my mind goes. I've never been like, not that it's not an outside the box thinking. I absolutely think of certain things in that way, but it's almost like that's something that I work on that i understand that maybe it's not my natural tendency to be like a higher level thinker like outside the box naturally and yet i'm able to get there through a willingness to even though it's not my natural tendency and like just going back to when i had my job in digital advertising that was something i had to actively work on was like the strategic side of of things whereas for me it came a lot more natural to just like dig my head into something and just grind on it for a while and so finding that balance has been you know very helpful because it's more comfortable for me to follow a structure and since i think understanding that there isn't so much of a structure to reality as much as I used to think there was it's forced my mind to open up a little bit more and has unlocked certain things that I haven't wouldn't have recognized if I wasn't aware of of that tendency to just get caught up in in the weeds of things like I I have to it's not that I actively take steps forward to dig into the weeds it's that i have to actively take steps back in order to pull myself out of the weeds and and ask like all right so i'm doing this right now but but why am i doing this like that's something that i very much had to i had to do at my last job and and just i'm constantly kind of 
reminding myself of because I can get very lost in just the what's happening in the moment as opposed to why it's happening, which isn't a good or a bad thing. It's just a tendency that I have. Whereas I would have the temptation to always be thinking like, we can do this better, which is why I'm the least likely to be happy with their job, regardless of how well I get paid. It's because I, I always think to myself, yeah, but we could we could do more with this. We could do this better, right? And that's that temptation to be impatient with others who don't necessarily see that vision, right? But I would like to posit that you are going to change over time based on the fact that you keep letting go. Like the reason that I'm such an ideas person, because I, I wasn't at one point, I wasn't always like this. It's because I keep jumping in. And every time I jump in without having that preparation, because I, I used to prefer preparation. I used to be one of those people who would prepare for weeks for something. So I get it. But the more you jump in and just let it go, the more I think you start switching in terms of that, that perceiving side rather than judging side. You're not looking at it quite so much as how's it going to go? Is it going to weigh this way? Is it going to weigh that way? What's going to be the end result? You're more or less just willing to throw yourself in and witness that and that's why i find it funny that that perceiving end for me is you know at 57 percent or or whatnot because at one point it was way on the other side everything was something to be afraid of everything was something to be afraid of and just for shits and giggles i actually went and looked up isfj and i find this to be so very interesting because this was very much my mentality probably around the late teens to around 20 years old uh, on personality trait measures, I would have scored as conservative, conventional, guarded, and reserved. And that's very true. I was still defining myself by a lot of different things, including the military background of my family, Roman Catholicism, and whatnot. There was a large intention to define myself, to protect myself, to find where I fit in the world. Uh, I was among the types most likely to believe in a higher spiritual power. I believed in God. I just hated it. Most likely than average to experience chronic pain. I was constantly complaining. I had rampant health issues at the time. Among types most likely to suffer heart disease. This is when I was going through crippling anxiety to the point where I actually had to go to a doctor because of complications with my heart. Second most common type among education majors in college, more likely than others to watch more than three hours of television per day. I used to work at a blockbuster video in my teens. I would watch movies as often as I could when I wasn't out drinking or getting high. Personal values include happy family, health, and spirituality. And for me, that was a huge thing because I didn't have any of those things, or rather I always had the toxic side of it, so I couldn't stop fixating on it. Among the three types with the lowest income, commonly found in education, healthcare, and religious occupations. And so I find it very interesting that that was my life to a very large degree at some point. And it was just because of my perception of myself and my place in the world. It changed everything I did. It changed everything I looked at and it changed how I reacted to everything I looked at. And of course it did. So this test and tests like it are really just indicating your current perception of yourself. They're not indicating that it's you, just the you that you've gotten attached to through habit and comfort. And that's the danger is walking away from this going, that's me. It doesn't have to be. You can look at each and every one of those things that they're talking about in your category. You can look at all of the pros and the cons. You can look at the things you're working with and the things you're working against and actively work with that as just a basis for some insight and self-reflection. You don't have to take it as set in stone. Oh, I'm an introvert. That's it. I'm an introvert. Get out more. Be uncomfortable. Talk to more people until it stops being uncomfortable. And immediately, oh, that's never going to stop being. You're telling yourself a story again. You don't know. But as long as you're telling yourself it's always going to be uncomfortable, guess what you've done? You've made it more uncomfortable. You're constantly building it up and you don't have to. You can have the audacity to challenge it. You can look at who you think you are and all the behaviors that society has recognized go with your current view of yourself and then totally turn it on its ass and do something totally different. You have that freedom. You have that power. These are just meant to be tools like anything else. Yeah. And they, they are fun to, uh, to look at, but yeah, I think, I think that's very much the main pitfall of these is that people 
they see how it is reflective of their life, how they perceive themselves, how maybe they think other people perceive themselves. And because there's always that draw to settle on false certainty, we settle on it and then we use it to define ourselves. And then it just reinforces that behavior as we go. It's like those, uh, the paths, the paths in the snow sledding down the hill as, as we are going down certain ways. And then we come across a test like this just deepens those paths as opposed to understanding that we don't have to dig deeper. Like there is, it's okay to not fit in to something perfectly exactly just because you're said to be an introvert doesn't mean you can't go out and be extroverted try and meet new people but as we cling to it as we think like oh this is this is what i am i'm an introvert so not gonna go out anymore it's like no that's not what it means at all it's something that can be molded and and changed and not even molded or changed because that makes it sound like you're going from one certainty to another. It's just something you don't have to settle upon. It's something that you can spit in the face of whenever the fuck you want. Like you can go do the exact opposite of the thing that it says that you typically do. Cause there's probably something new to learn in that almost. <laughs> that's funny. Cause it's like with these tests, it's a way for you to recognize where your tendencies lie and then actually use it as a way to change, to totally flip it on its head. I'm going to be an ISTP tomorrow as opposed to an ENFJ because I can, because why the fuck not? Because I'm sitting in eternity right now and I have the opportunity to do anything with this experience right now. I don't have to settle upon this way of life that this test told me that I was. I can do anything right now. Is it going to be uncomfortable if it's not the tendency that I skew towards or lean towards? Absolutely. But discomfort is a, is a great teacher for anyone. And yet we're just not willing to go there because we avoid discomfort at all costs. As soon as we come across something like this, we're like, all right, sweet. This is me for the rest of my life. And it doesn't have to be because as you settle upon it, as you settle into a specific narrative, a specific label for yourself through a test like this, you you hinder your own growth. And by exploring some of the other ends of the spectrum purposefully, despite the discomfort, it's a way that you can grow. It's a way that you can change and, and learn more about the reality of what you are, being reality, being everything. Not just the limited idea that's defined by, you know, four little letters. But you actually have to want to do it. It has to be willingly. And it's trickier than it sounds. And what I mean is, how many times in your life have you just randomly thought to yourself, I wonder if I can learn how to write with my opposite hand? And maybe played around with it for a little bit, maybe practiced a little bit, probably when you were younger in your teens or something like that. And then you just stop doing it, right? And you stop doing it because it's damned uncomfortable and the world is requiring things of you that you just fall back on the hand you're used to using. But if I was to lop off your hand, you would have to learn. You would have to adapt. It's not that you couldn't the whole time. It's that you didn't want to put the time and the attention in. It's not that you couldn't. It's that you didn't want to willingly. You had to wait until it was forced upon you. And that's very much the same with your personality. It's really just time and attention and synaptic pruning. That's really all it is. I used to be such an introvert that having a conversation with people would put me into such a state of anxiety that I would literally start to black out or vomit. I was terrified of people. How did I get over that? By avoiding people? By calling myself an introvert? No, because I can't make money or survive that way. So I had to push through. I had to find a way and through time and attention and not telling myself I couldn't do it. I ended up eventually, according to this test, being 51% extrovert, which is funny because again, most people who know me, who have talked to me either on the groups or in person would probably assume that I'm massively on the extrovert side. 
And it's because of my willingness to dive into the situation I'm a part of. If I'm around people, I'm with those people. If I'm alone, I'm alone. And I switch accordingly. But that takes a willingness to switch. And it takes a willingness to question who you think you are. So you can be anything. Yeah. And I think that's the ultimate lesson of these tests is that although it can point to where you're currently at, where you currently see yourself, it is in no way a death sentence. <laughs> it is in no way a end of the road. You're always changing and growing, but as you settle upon certain things, it's going to hinder that ability to do so, to morph to the situation, to be the situation that you are in each and every moment, because no situations are the same unless you try and curate your life to be the same situation over and over. But guess what? That's basically impossible. There's always going to be different situations that you face and your willingness to let go of the idea of you will inform how well you can be that situation at hand. So holding that idea lightly will allow for you to fluctuate between all ends of this personality spectrum. And ultimately, that's what being reality comes down to, is how well can you swing and ride the spectrum? Because it's almost like every situation is a different part of this spectrum. Every single situation that we experience and the conflict that we experience is how much we cling to the idea of what we think we are relative to the experience that we're having. But every experience is going to be different. And your willingness to let go of the idea of what you think you are will inform how well you can be that situation. I have to say, I am very curious about how much one's perspective of unity would affect the results of this test. And what I mean is in a state of mind where you are looking at yourself as the collective, your answers would be radically different from when they ask you things like, do you tend to be more of a planner or are you more of a feeler kind of deal? And I know I'm oversimplifying. You'd be like, what, like in terms of my whole history is, is all of humanity. And you'd be looking back at all your wars and all your religions and all your artwork and everything else. It'd be a totally different test. You would be coming from a totally different mentality. I'd be very curious as to what the result of God doing a Myers-Briggs test would be. <laughs> so I just want to throw this out there. Two things. This has been a fun conversation. I've really enjoyed this community topics episode. Um, that wasn't one of the two things. The first one was that we should do another Myers-Briggs test in like a year or two years time and look back at this conversation and see the variability, because I'm very curious. Absolutely. Um, secondly, we should do one when we're on psychedelics. Yes, definitely. I'm always down to do stuff on psychedelics. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, I, I think that would be uh, a lot of fun. And it's funny, we, we actually took this or a similar test. It was a Myers-Briggs test uh, at work a few years ago. And I don't remember what I was, but I think I might have been the same because it said some of the famous people in uh involved or that are similar and i think oprah winfrey is a enfj and i think i remember her being that but it's funny I i'd be curious how much my percentages have have shifted because i've always been kind of like this it's just how masked i've been to the reality of being myself and i think over time i've just become more of what I've always been. It's just how willing I was to see myself as that because the traits have always been there. You know, the, the empathy and concern for others, as I was saying earlier, has always been there. It's just how my perspective of myself has shifted, but those traits are still there. They're just in a completely different light. So definitely down to try on psychedelics and definitely down to uh, make this a annual or you know, every two year type thing for us. <laughs> well, and it's interesting because even your experience of empathy is eventually going to waver and go back and forth because empathy, not governed by clarity, 
isn't really empathy. You have to have empathy for other people, but there are no other people, which gives you a greater sense of empathy. And so it becomes a totally different thing. Empathy and selfishness become the same thing. Right? And so I think as you progress down the path, it's more than likely you're going to find yourself more and more in the middle of all of those spectrums, I think, is the entire point of it. Though, I, I don't know. It is a really interesting model. Uh, admittedly, there are a lot of limitations to it, which, of course, even people in the uh, psychological field will admit there are limitations to this. It can't encapsulate the entire person. It can't cover everything in terms of your behavior and the things that you perceive it's very dualistic in how it measures things on a spectrum of one side to the other so there's a lot of oversimplicity in this but that all said it's still super interesting i definitely enjoy doing this episode for sure and i'm grateful to the person who suggested this for this week's community topics i do want to just say quickly we have one ticket left for our april retreat i'm very excited about the April retreat, because we're going to be able to get deeper into this conversation for one, because we're going to have two counselors with us at that retreat this time, guests, they're not working for us, don't come for therapy. Um, but we're going to talk about a lot in terms of who are we? Are we adaptable? Do we have to stick to a certain personality type? How malleable is that based on our willingness to change? And how malleable is that based on our role as reality itself. And so the April retreat is going to be just a fantastic deep dive into so many of these conversations, though, again, all the retreats will be, but the April retreat is coming in six weeks. So I'm especially excited about that one. Um, that all said, if you would like to suggest a topic for our next community topics episode or any community topics episode, do join us on Discord. It's totally free. You can find our Discord by going to dualisticunity.com and clicking on community. You can suggest a topic in the Community Topics channel, and then you can vote on the weekly topics on our Patreon page at patreon.com slash dualisticunity. And there's so many perks to joining us on Patreon. I'm not even going to get into it. Otherwise, we're going to spend another 10 minutes on this episode. Uh, yeah, it's funny even just going through this just real quick, just thinking about um, our roles at the retreat. I saw that as I kept thinking about the retreat as I was going through this and and how reflective of these types of personalities they are. Cause as much as we're both hosts of it, um, we do play sort of different roles at it. And it was pretty in line with the descriptions for, for these uh, personalities, which I found to be very funny. But if you want to see those uh, in action <laughs> or uh, the lack of those in action, uh, definitely check out the, the retreat is going to be a blast and yeah, one ticket left. It's going to be, I'm excited for that one because as much as I'm very excited for the Netherlands in November, this is going to be a lot more intimate. There's going to be a lot more depth to it. Um, so I'm excited for whoever gets that, gets that last ticket. Um, but yeah, excited to, uh, hear about other people's perspectives on this whole idea of personality traits. And I'm sure some people listening will check that out um after this episode and it'll be fun to chat about them on patreon in our upcoming groups yeah definitely if you do the test let us know what you came up with in our next group we would love to know and we'd love to have more of this conversation as you may have noticed as we're way over time for what we normally do in a community topics episode so we're going to end this here thank you so much for joining us as always we will see you next week take care bye everyone